Okay, open your Bibles up to uh, Romans 3.21. <coughs> this is the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. Yay! Okay. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, I don't care about all the history stuff. Well, that's fine. Just go be there. Uh, you're going to get your history stuff today. Now, why does all this matter? Okay, five, wait, wait, not 517. It's 500 years, not 1500 years. 1517, 500 years ago, the church was in need of reform. And for us, who mainly are people who come out of Western Europe, that meant the Catholic Church was in need of reform. A lot of us in the room were raised Catholic or have a lot of Catholic experience in our background. This is not going to be a trash Catholic sermon. Just hang on. Um, the deal was, is the Catholic Church at the time was headed up by a Pope Leo X. All right? Now, I said the church needed reform. There were boatloads of voices for two or three hundred years within the Catholic Church before Martin Luther that said the church was in need of reform. And I was going to read you a big old quote about that, but I won't. What did God do to this issue? Why did, how did God address this issue? He raised up a lot of people who were calling for reform. One of them was Martin Luther. He was born in 1483. Um, the Catholic Church at the time was off course. And I'll give you the biggest example of that in a minute. But have you ever been off course? That happens to people. It happens to organizations. It happens to businesses. If you start out on a journey, like you're going from point A to point B, and you're going and you think it's a straight line, and you're, you're off like half a degree over, if your journey is 1,500 years, you're going to go, whoop, right? You've got to have a constant course direction to get from point A to point B. And that is basically what happened to the church. Luther came to believe that it needed reform, that over this 1,500 years, it had gotten off course. And I want you to look at a scripture that was one of his big scriptures in talking about this. This is Romans 3, 21. You can cheat by looking on the cover of your bulletin, or you can actually open up the Word of God. Here we go. But now... Apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction since all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. They are now justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. All right. Martin Luther was born, 1483. He was raised to literally fear God. He was also raised to literally fear his dad. His name was Hans Luther. Um, Hans Luther, anybody have a controlling father? Don't raise your hands. Uh, Hans Luther was like the poster boy for controlling dads. He wanted his son, youth, don't look at your dads. Hang on. He wanted his son to be a lawyer, and so he twisted everything and made him a lawyer. Luther actually studied law. But the deal was, is Luther was uh, riding home from law school one day, it was July the 2nd, 1505, and he got caught in a thunderstorm. He was on horseback, so he's standing like 10 feet in the air on horseback in a thunderstorm. It's raining, it's bad, and a tree was split next to him by lightning. And he freaked out completely because, you know, his dad is a control freak. And so he's like, oh, oh, i got to make daddy happy. i got to make daddy happy. He's a nervous wreck like that to begin with. And the tree blows up the sides. And what he says is, if you get me out of this God, I'll become a monk. And 16 days later, he got into the monastery. And daddy was mad. <laughs> daddy was bent out of shit. There's actually, um, uh, it's actually a scene in a movie, but it's based on a historic thing. There's a, there's a movie called Luther with Ray Fiennes that plays playing Luther. And there's this scene where Luther is serving communion for the very first time. And his dad is in the congregation. And Luther is so, he messes up the bread and spills the wine. I mean, that's what a nervous wreck this guy was. And life in the monastery did not agree with him. Okay, he began to give himself over to what you and I would call religious legalism. He was, there are all kinds of patterns and disciplines in monastic life. But Luther was going kookburger overboard. 
okay? Um, he had all kinds of his own legalistic prayer rituals. He had all kinds of his own legalistic fasting rituals and these really weird, arduous pilgrimages. He went from Germany to Rome on foot, barefoot, or something like that. He said this about his monastic experience. I lost touch with Christ the Savior and Comforter, and I made him the jailer and the hangman of my poor soul. Now, monasteries do not run themselves like this, and the abbot, the abbot is the head of the monastery, and the abbot saw that Luther was wrong. Okay? And so he goes to him, and he talks to him, and he tries to work this out with him, but he just can't. And so what he does is like, look, this monastic thing is not for you. Uh, you need to go study. Uh, I'm going to make. I'm going to work this out. I'm going to send you to the University of Wittenberg, uh, and you're going to get on track to be ordained as a priest. And you can quit all this 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 other stuff because this is not going to fly in the real world, son. So he goes off, and in 1512, Luther gets his doctorate and he starts teaching the Bible at the University of Wittenberg. And guess what book of the Bible he specializes in? Romans. Now, get back to that in a minute. Now, a little more historical stuff. Pope Leo X decided that he wanted to build a new cathedral in Rome. Why? Because old St. Peter's Basilica, where the Pope had his headquarters in Rome, where the Papal States were centered and ruled from, was 1,100 years old. And it was literally falling apart. But it was going to be expensive to build a new St. Peter's Basilica. And decide, by the way, when the Pope speaks, He's speaking from the balcony that Pope Leo X built, okay? Like when Francis is out there talking, that's where he's standing. Pope Leo X did not, he had gobs of money, but he didn't want to spend his own money. So he sent these people out all over Christendom to sell indulgences. Now, indulgences had been around for a while, and to be really, really fair, money was almost never directly involved uh, the Catholic teaching at the time, the indulgence was only for faithful Christians and then only granted by the church in remission of some kind of earthly punishment for sins that had already been forgiven. Uh, before Pope Leo X, ordinary people got these indulgences by going to a worship service or saying a certain prayer or a series of prayers. It was never with money. All right? This is where everything crossed the line and we sort of turned to the dark side. All right? And most people didn't get indulgences for themselves. It wasn't like, gee, I'd really like to go sin, and here's 50 bucks, uh, you know, woohoo, big party time this weekend, all right? What they did was they, 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 they got an indulgence to get a loved one out of purgatory when Pope Leo X was selling these things. But he had made it out of money, okay? He made it about money. There was actually the, the guy who was sent to Germany to raise the money, his name was Johann Tetzel. And uh, he was a, a piece of work, I tell you. And he had this thing that he said. He would go to preach in congregations, and he would say to this thing, this little ditty, he would say, as soon as a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. And it, was, it, it, wasn't, it, it, it wasn't good, okay? And you could call it the mother of all capital campaigns, if you want to, okay? Now, where did they get this stuff? Where, where do you... Where do they get this stuff that, 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 that faith has to live in action, okay? And, and then you interpret action in a weird way and you get Johann Tetzel running around collecting money in Germany. They got it from James, book of James, chapter 2. James 2, 14. This is a big chunk of scripture, so hang on. My brothers and sisters, you're going to hear a lot of Methodists quote this verse, so hang on. My brothers and sisters, what good is it if people claim that they have faith but don't act like it? Can that kind of faith save them? You gotta act, not just have a bunch of intellectual assertions. Suppose a brother or a sister has no clothes or food. Suppose one of you says to him, go, I hope everything turns out good for you. Keep warm and eat well. And you do nothing about what they really need. Then what good have you done? It is the same with faith. It doesn't cause us to do something, it's dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I do good works. Well, show me your faith that doesn't do good works and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God. Good! Even the demons believe that. And they tremble. Okay, you know what? I agree with that scripture. And John Wesley agreed with that scripture. Faith is active or it's not. Faith stands on the promises all day long, but it never sits on the premises, so to speak. 
Now, if you have faith and don't do anything with it, you know, we do that confession of faith every week. Sometimes I doubt whether you're really confessing what you really believe. But, back to the original thing. In Luther's mind, and the minds of many, Pope Leo X had crossed a line. He's the professor of biblical studies at the University of Wittenberg, and he reads those words. But now the righteousness of God has been disclosed. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Not based on some indulgence that you sell or buy. Through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now Luther didn't try to start a revolution. He wrote a document. And it's kind of, there's a picture of it that's on the cover of your bulletin. A uh, representation of that moment. He wrote a document called the 95 Theses on the Power and Effectiveness of Indulgence. Now, what was this thing? This was basically 95 statements or questions that questioned the sale of indulgences and many other teachings of the Catholic Church and at the time. And Luther looked at the Bible and he read that salvation was complete and eternal for all who believed, not just because you put a coin in a coffin. And he believed that indulgences could never absolve a buyer's punishment, let alone eternal salvation. So you realize what a problem this was for Pope Leo X. And so what he did was he ordered all of Europe to try to kill Martin Luther. And more or less. And Luther had the benefit of living in the Holy Roman Empire. The Holy Roman Empire was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. It was a confederation of little fiefdoms that is in what we know of as central Germany. And so if you were protected by one of the lords of the fiefdoms, nobody could mess with you. And one of them protected you. And then slowly that lord convinced other lords. And that's why Lutheranism has its heart in central Germany. That's why a lot of the German and Scandinavian immigrants to the United States, up in Minnesota, uh, are all, a lot of Lutherans are up there, that's fine, okay? But it was too late at that point for Pope Leo X. The printing press had made Luther's questions go viral. And he never intended to do that. When he posted those things on there, he wasn't trying to start a revolution. He was actually inviting people to what would be, what you and I would call a graduate student, a graduate student discussion session. But somebody took it, somebody copied it, put it in the printing press, and va va voom. Now, how does this affect our lives now? What do we learn from these things? Um, the first thing that I learn is, is you look to the scriptures first. Where did Luther get all this stuff? He got it from the Bible. He was an uptight, nervous wreck Bible nerd. And if those people can change the world, <laughs> Anybody can change the world. Luther rallied his reformers with this cry called sola scriptura. And that means by scripture alone. For Luther, the Bible was the compass of the Christian faith. I mean, if you're talking to somebody who looks at the Bible and then starts talking about historical context and claims that it says the exact opposite of what it says, you need to really, really question the thinking credentials of that person. The Bible is the believer's compass for comfort and joy, as Becker was talking about, as we were singing about. And that sounds really common to us today, Bible alone and all that stuff. But in Luther's time, this thing was as radical as like a balanced federal budget or something like that. It was just crazy. Anything that we experience in life and faith, anything that we reason out, must be tested and held to the standard of the Word of God, especially in the church. I don't know if you're watching the news or watching the Methodist news wires at all. We've got some problems with that right now. And especially, we need to be holding it up to our own lives. That's why it's important to study the Word of God. So that we don't get lost, we don't veer off course. Or worse, do nothing. So do you study the Word of God? Do you study the portions of it that are difficult for you? For those of you who have a heart for the poor and social actions, do you study the passages in the Bible about evangelism and sharing the gospel? For those of you who have a heart for evangelism, do you pay attention 
to the parts of the Bible that talk about touching the heart of the poor? Or do you just stick with the areas of the Scripture where you're comfortable? What are you going to do to share the gospel? What are you going to do to, show, to touch the heart of the poor? And I don't mean to be melodramatic. There is a spiritual war on, okay? There's a spiritual war on against sort of a speciously sophisticated moral confusion that's in our world today. If you would like an example of speciously sophisticated moral confusion, I have one name for you. Harvey Weinstein. Okay? And allegedly, there's a lot more of him. You wonder why those people act the way they do. And the scriptures and how we act in our faith are the only offensive weapons that we have to combat this stuff with love. <coughs> now think about the words to the hymn that we sang, the very first hymn. Mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. He is our helper amid the flood of prevailing mortal ills. Why do we need this help? Because our ancient foe still seeks to work us woe. His craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate, and on earth is not his equal. Second thing that we can learn from the Reformation and Luther is that we've got to emphasize justification by faith. You cannot ultimately save yourself by doing a bunch of good works. You're never going to be good enough, especially compared to God. And the standard is God himself. The only thing that God has set aside is trusting in him. You've got uh, Genesis. And Abraham believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned or counted it to him as righteousness. You don't get saved. You don't get eternal life by bowing to Mecca 47,000 times a day. You're not justified or saved by obeying some religious law, although it can inform behavior. We're not justified by being what our society calls a good person. Harvey Weinstein was called a good person by Michael Moore in 2014. Okay, there's the pot, call the kettle, whatever. Now, we are justified by faith, and then we move forward into action. What is faith? Same as it was for Abraham. You trust in God's promises, not on ourselves or on yourself or on works. I was in um, Stevie B's Pizza yesterday, and I realized that I'm not... I'm not good with mediocre pizza and a lot of loud child games. I used to be that way back in the 80s. And I realized, I was like, man, this is one of my definitions of hell. <laughs> you know? This is one of my definitions of hell. And then I remembered, ah, but you trust in God's promises. <laughs> I was going to say, if I get to heaven, which I hate that phrase. If you actually trust in God's promises, then you know so you don't have to be worried about locked in Stevie B's for all the time you can each other. Okay? Just like Abraham. Justified by faith. Now, do you have faith? Think about these words. In the hymn again. Here we go. Did we in our own strength confide? No! Our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side. The man of God's own choosing. What right man? Christ Jesus is He from age to age the same, and He will win the battle. Do you have that kind of faith? And if you don't have it, ask for more. Hunger and thirst for it. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened unto you. Now, final thing I learned from all this, the Reformation stuff, is the priesthood of all believers. Luther challenged the church teaching that becoming a priest or a pastor was the highest calling of God. Instead, he taught that every single person, it doesn't matter if they're a butcher or a baker or a rocket ship maker, they are called by God. And you, every single one of you, are called by God. Your Heavenly Father looks on you every single day and smiles because He knows what you can do through Him. And more importantly, He knows who you can be through Him. He has a vision for your life, and it's a plan that nearly always surprises, but it always blesses those who follow it. Now, if you were here last week, we had Mark Stearns from Lincoln Village Ministry, and I hope you come to Pastor's Bible Study at 4.30 and 6.15 on Wednesday. I hope you got a lot out of that talk last week if you were here. If you didn't, you can learn at Pastor's Bible Study. Okay, now, 
This is one of the reasons you should never, ever, ever miss a Sunday. I know that football is tempting in the fall, but never miss a Sunday, okay? You should know that God is going to do something. Every time you walk in this room on Sunday, it doesn't matter if there is a problem with the heater. <laughs> Mark Stearns has no theology degree. Mark Stearns, part of his brain by his own admission is so fried that he really doesn't know any $10 words. <laughs> He's a funny guy. He's just an ordinary guy who follows an ordinary God. He evangelized the hardest streets in Madison County. He got his GED and he's proud of it. He learned his fractions at age 52, but he built a team of 37 people that took over a failing school and used it as an instrument to touch the heart of the poor and break the cycle of poverty in this county. This is what being the hands and feet of Christ can look like. So priesthood of all believers, what about it? If we are the hands and feet of Christ, we are the ministers of the gospel. Everyone who is in Christ Jesus is on a mission. And we are building a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. We are not sacrificing bulls and blood. We are sacrificing time and treasure and talent that the world might be redeemed. Mark built a team to redeem a neighborhood. He is going on to build an even bigger team of employees and volunteers to take over other neighborhoods. He is going in and quote unquote of the Old Testament possessing the land. And it was done by the mysterious power of the gospel, not some secular program. What are the words to the hymn? God has willed his truth to triumph through us. Think about that thing. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them, abideth the Spirit, and the gifts are ours through Him who with us sighteth. God has willed His truth to triumph through us. The Spirit and the gifts are ours. What does that mean? That means there is no stopping those who are in Christ Jesus who hunger after God's vision. That is why the Protestant Reformation is so important. That is why it changed the world. It doesn't matter if you're here and you're Catholic in your background or Methodist in your background or Lutheran in your background or Baptist in your background. It doesn't matter. All we need is the gospel revealed through the Bible, the faith the Lord calls us to, and then the will to do something with that faith, to be a priest to somebody who needs it, especially the least of these. Now look, I'm hoping you're praying over your commitments for 2018. Next couple of weeks, really, really, really remember that. There is a reformation out there every single day. And God has willed His truth to triumph through us. So long live the reformation. I pray for Christian unity, but long live the reformation. Long live unity. And folks, be the reformation for somebody today, tomorrow, this week, this month, this year, for the rest of your life. Amen? Amen. Amen.